to be seated. The Bible says here in verse number 4, as we just read together, I have no greater joy. Now, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God this morning? Oh, a few of you believe the Bible is the Word of God. Or, or some of you believe it, you just are waking up. Let's try it again. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God this morning? If it's the Word of God, then every word inside it is inspired by God. And every word is here for a reason. And He means everything that He says. God doesn't say anything flippantly. You and I, from time to time, we say things flippantly. We say things and we don't think about what it is we're saying. We write things uh, all the time anymore. It seems like we hear about people on uh, TV who are uh, maybe on Twitter or Facebook or some type of social media and they put something out there and then after they put it out there, they think to themselves, I should have never done that. But they already hit enter and it's out there. God doesn't do that. He doesn't write something and then say, oh, I wish I could take it back. Everything is there for a purpose. And here he has John write in verse number 4, I have no greater joy. If God had John write that, then he meant that. That God has no greater joy. That John at this time in the history of the church had no greater joy than what he wrote in verse number 4. Than to hear that my children, those that had turned to Jesus Christ, those that had received Christ as their Savior, those that were growing in their faith, that had started out as newborn babes, as Peter mentions in his letter, and now have matured a little bit in their faith and have actually become children, have the ability to walk in their faith. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. This is a principle that we've been studying over and over again, but as we get into the message this morning, I want us to be reminded that John had no greater joy. There was nothing that brought him more joy than to see those young Christians, who he had the privilege of leading to the Lord, to see them get into their, their, the Scripture and to memorize it, to pray and to talk to God, to witness and to tell others about Jesus Christ. He had no greater joy than to watch them as they begin to grow from a baby to a toddler to now a child in their faith. And the same is true this morning for God Almighty, our, our Heavenly Father, who looks down from heaven, and He had John pen these words, because these were words that were not only on John's heart, but these were words that are on the heart of God. And He says, I have no greater joy. This morning, God has no greater joy than to watch you and me walk in truth. He has no greater joy than to see us go from that, that a feeble state of a baby when we first received Christ as Savior. Think back to that day that you trusted Christ. That day that you called upon the name of the Lord in simple faith, knowing that you could not save yourself, knowing that your good works could not take you to heaven, knowing that being a member of a church was not going to get you there, knowing that baptism was not going to help you get through the pearly gates one day. Think back to that day that you trusted Christ as Savior. That day that you received Him. You were born into the family of God. You were a newborn. And just as I watched all five of my precious born into this world, and I took joy in that. God, when you were born into the family of God, took joy in that. When he, you received His Son as Savior, He took joy in knowing that you were now part of His family. But you know, as I watch my kids grow, each and every day, they do things that bring me more and more joy. And God, as He has watched you go from that a state of an infant to go, going to being a toddler to where you're sort of crawling on your hands and your knees to now being a child of God where you're able to stand and to walk because you've been in the Bible a little bit more than you were when you were first born into the family of God or you spend a little bit more time in prayer than you did when you were first born into the family of God. You tell more people about your Heavenly Father, about your loving Savior. He takes no greater joy than to watch you continue to grow. You, as you grow in your faith, bring Him more and more and more joy. I mentioned this uh, to someone the other day. I don't remember if it was uh, when I went to pick up my wife from the youth conference, but my, uh, my five kids, of course, were with me Monday through Thursday, and my mother and father-in-law helped watch them some. And Wednesday night we got home from the service, and uh, leading up to every service, my mind's racing, going a hundred different directions. I'm thinking about things that need to be done. I'm, I, I'm, I'm praying for people to be there that, that, that the Lord's laid on my heart. And, and so I'm a very serious person usually leading up to the service. And then after the service, there's, there's sort of a, a letdown. And, uh, 
you know, just I'm able to relax more. When we got home Wednesday night, and I told the girls to go upstairs and get changed into their pajamas, and I went to get the boys changed into their pajamas, and, and uh, I, I watched these two as Tim and John were standing there, and Jonathan goes up to Timothy, and he says, I almost taller than you. And, John, and Timothy goes, no, you're not. I'm almost five. And I'm taller than you. And Jonathan goes, I almost taller. And he stands up on his tippy toes and he goes, I almost taller than you. And Jonathan and Timothy goes, Well, when I'm five, I'm going to be this tall, you know? And they're they're going back and forth. And it just brought me so much joy watching them growing up. I can't believe as I want to look at Abigail, she's ten years old. She's going to be eleven in August. And I and I think, where did the time go? I mean, she was so little in Ukraine, it seemed like just yesterday, before I know it, she's going to be uh, going off to college, graduating from high school and going off to college. In another 30 years, Brother Wagner, she may get married. Another 30 years, you know, when she's 40, 41. Amen, brother? I mean, it depends. If my shotgun's working or not, she may get married sooner than that. But if my shotgun jams, she might, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, they, my kids bring me so much joy. The same joy that they bring me is the same joy that you and I bring to God, our Heavenly Father, as He watches us walk in truth. Real quickly here, I want you to look back to the Old Testament with me for a simple thought. Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number 10. Nehemiah is right before the book of Esther, right before the book of Job, right before the book of Psalms in that area. Nehemiah chapter number 10. Now we've been as I said, talking about walking in truth all year. Six months. Can you believe it's already the last Sunday in June? I mean, as I told someone this morning, just the other day it seemed like uh, uh, summer was starting. It seemed like just the other day the, the kids were talking about getting out of school, and now they've already been out of school for uh, a couple of weeks. Some, some kids have been out of school for a month, a little over a month, depending on where they go to school. And we're getting ready to get into July. Independence Day is coming up this week, 4th of July. Uh, fireworks are coming. Make sure that you have yours. Make sure you don't set anybody's house on fire. I remember one time we were over in Ukraine, and Brother Matt Hudson on New Year's, he says, let's get some of those Roman candles. I love, that's one thing I loved about Ukraine. You could buy almost any type of firework, and none of them were illegal. And if they were, people didn't care. They still shot them off anyhow. And so we went and got a Roman candle, Brother Hughes, and it was it was winter. So think about Ukraine in the middle of winter. Ice and snow everywhere. And so we dug a little hole, we stuck that Roman candle in, in the ground, and we lit it. And I've never done a Roman candle before because in Iowa most fireworks are illegal because you might set a cornfield on fire. So I didn't know what to expect. We lit it, and I took off running. And then we turn around, we see it shooting up, and we're thinking, wow, this is great. We're having a good time. All of a sudden we see that Roman candle tip. And we're thinking, oh, what's going to happen? And it tipped not towards us, but uh, over to the left of us. We're back towards the house, uh, our house. And it tips to the left of us, starts shooting right at my neighbor's outhouse. And I start thinking, I hope no one's in there right now, or they're getting the, the time of their life, but their whole life's going to be brightened up right now. Nonetheless, all these things are happening. Time is flying by. And we've been talking about this subject, walking in truth now for six months. Read your Bible. Pray. Tell people about Jesus. Be faithful to be in church. Make sure you're giving towards the work of God. Make sure you keep yourself clean. Keep yourself separated from wrong things, wicked things. We've been talking about this. In the last couple of weeks, we've been talking from the Old Testament about Solomon and David and how that Solomon wanted to walk in the truth of God just like his dad David did. We talked about Hezekiah, who was an ancestor of Solomon, a king, king of Judah, and how they, he walked in truth. Now we look at Nehemiah. And real briefly, let me just sort of bring you up to speed what's going on. When we left Hezekiah last week, Hezekiah was the king of Judah. God was blessing Judah. But Israel was taken into bondage. Assyria came in. They swallowed up the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. Now by the time we get to the book of Nehemiah, both Israel and Judah have been swallowed up. You have the Babylonian Empire that's reigning. And all of the, uh, the people of God have been swallowed up. They're being ruled over by this empire. And a, a vast majority of them have been carried away to Babylon. That's where the book of Daniel comes into play. And here in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is sent back to Jerusalem because the city of Jerusalem, the city of grandeur, the city that Solomon reigned on. And remember, Solomon was one of the wisest and richest kings ever to live. Remember, there wasn't one thing in his house that was made out of silver. It was all made out of gold. 
This one place that was so spectacular at one point in time is now just a, a, a rubbish, a, a land of rubbish and waste. The walls have been broken down. The house of God, the temple, has been uh, destroyed. And the people have now been sent back to rebuild the temple and in the book of Nehemiah to rebuild the walls, to fortify the walls. And they're fortifying these walls, making them strong again. And it's symbolic that sometimes in our lives, the walls that are there to protect us get broken down. Walls are not there just to keep, uh, uh, keep us from wandering outside. Although sometimes people think that when you preach the Bible and you preach the truth and you preach separation and you preach standards, that wow, it's just a preacher setting up these walls that we're not supposed to go outside of. But those walls are there to protect you and to protect me. And the Word of God sets up spiritual walls for us that we shouldn't wander outside of. Because if we do, guess who's outside those walls? The enemy who wants to destroy us, who wants to defeat us, the devil. So these walls are symbolic. Now in Nehemiah chapter number 10, the walls have been rebuilt. The city's ready to go. It's ready to thrive and to flourish once again. And look at verse number 28 here. Verse number 28 says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands under the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they claved to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, and His judgments and His statutes, and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, or take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every day. Also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, for the set feasts, and for the holy things, and for the sin offerings, to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We're going to stop right here. Now, we read over those verses very quickly. And as we read over them, you may have listened or you may have followed along and thought to yourself, I'm lost. What's going on? So let's go back and break it down real quickly here. At the end of verse number 28, we're told about a group of people. This group of people is described at the end of verse number 28 as a group of people, every one of which had understanding and knowledge. These were people that understood, that knew. By the way, and I've said this before, I remember when I was a kid. And I watched cartoons, and I watched G.I. Joe. At the end of G.I. Joe, they'd always say, knowing is half the battle. Knowledge is very important. Uh, if a kid doesn't know what is right and what is wrong, how can you expect them to do right? You have to teach them so that they know. And then when they know and they understand, they're supposed to do it. They're supposed to follow it. And here we're told that these people had knowledge and they had understanding. In other words, they're symbolic of believers. They're symbolic of Christians this morning. You, if you uh, know that you're going to heaven when you die, you have knowledge, you have understanding. You have received Christ into your heart, and by receiving Christ, of course, what we mean is you have called upon the name of Jesus Christ, and when you called on Him, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside you. And now when you do wrong, you get convicted by the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside you. You get convicted, and when you do right, he promotes that. He encourages that. He tries to uh, get you to continue to grow in that direction and steers you away from the, the wrong ways and away from wickedness and evil. You have knowledge. You have understanding. The Bible says in verse number 28 about these people as well. It says that they were people who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land. They were not only saved, but they were separated. They were set apart. They were not the same as the people that lived in the cities around Jerusalem. By the way, as a Christian this morning, you already know where I'm going with this probably, but you as a Christian ought to be different than the rest of the world. 
You ought to be different because inwardly, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are different than the rest of the world. You know the majority of the people out there today do not know where they're going to spend eternity. They do not know whether they're going to heaven or whether they're going to hell. Because no one has ever told them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And that all they have to do is receive Him as Savior in order to go to heaven. Or maybe they have heard, but they've just rejected it. So if they don't have Jesus in their heart, you are different than them this morning. If you're different inwardly, then you should be different outwardly. There should be a difference. People ought to know you're a Christian by the things that you say, by the things that you do. As you've heard me mention before, the things you listen to, watch. Uh, all parts of your life ought to be changed because inwardly you are different now. You are changed. The Holy Spirit lives inside you, and as long as He lives inside you, then you ought to be holy or strive to be holy. Are you ever going to be perfect? No. But you ought to separate yourself. You ought to draw some lines in the sand and say, I'm not going to do that because I don't believe Jesus would do that. I'm not going to do that because God's Word says I shouldn't do that. I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to do those things. I am going to be separate. You know, when we were kids, how often did we do something dumb? And our parents would say, why did you do it? Well, Bobby did it. And what would our parents say? Probably every one of us heard it. If Bobby jumped off a bridge, would you jump off one too? Or something similar we heard. Yet isn't it amazing how in 21st century Christianity you have Christians saying, well, these people do this. Well, these people say it's okay to do this, and they pull something wrong or wicked out. Well, wait a second. Isn't that the same thing that our parents would tell us not to do just because Bobby did it doesn't mean you have to do it? Folks, we have to make sure we're separate. Just because the rest of the world says that there are certain things that are uh, okay doesn't mean that God says it's okay. Just because uh, the rest of the world is saying it's okay for a, a man to marry a man doesn't mean that God says it's okay. And God says it's wrong. Does God still love those people? Yes. But He doesn't love the sin. He doesn't love their sin. He doesn't love my sin. Because sin is disobedience to His Word. Hey, we have to separate ourselves. People may not like it. You think the people living around Jerusalem at this time uh, loved these people who separated themselves, who said, I'm sorry, but... We can't go to your feast to that pagan God. We don't believe in Him. We believe in one true God. We don't believe in many gods. Amen. You think that they were happy about that? Do you think that they loved these people? Probably not. But they still took a stand and they separated themselves. Look now at verse number 28 again. We'll see a third thing about them. Not only were they people who had knowledge and understanding, not only did they separate themselves, but at the beginning of verse number 28 it says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims. Who are these people? The third thing, they were the servants of God. They were servants. These were the people that were involved in the work of God. The, the young people heard a great message uh, Monday night by Pastor Tim Rule. The theme this last year at youth conference, or this year I should say, at youth conference was uh, uh, leaving it all on the field. It was a baseball theme. And he talked about how you have first, second, and third. And he said, first base is salvation. When a person gets saved, they get to first base. When they separate their lives and they live differently than the world, they get to second base. And when they begin to serve God, they get to third base. And he made this statement, it was so good, he says, you can't get home unless you first get to first base. Nobody ever scores or gets home without going to first base first. You have to get saved in order to go to heaven. But then he said a lot of people have second and third base mixed around. He said people get saved and then they automatically want to jump to third base. He said if, if we were playing baseball and I was on first base and the ball was hit and there's second base, the whiteboard, and third base is the table over there, and the ball was hit and I go running to third base and they get the ball and they throw it to the second baseman, I'm out. Because I went to the wrong base first. And he said the second base is a separation. There are some people in Christianity that they want to serve God. They want to be involved in the ministries of the church. And you know what? There's only two people that probably want you to be involved in the ministries of the church more than you. That's God and that's the pastor. Trust me, the pastor wants everybody involved in the ministries of the church. 
But you can't skip second base and say, I'm going to live how I want to live. I'm going to live a wicked life. I'm going to listen to the music I want to listen to. I'm going to drink what I want to drink. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to do what I want to do, but I still am going to serve God in the church. You can't do it. You're skipping second base. You need to get separated. And then you go on to serve God. God never called a drunk to be a pastor. He called a drunk to get saved, to separate his life, and then to become a pastor. People are trying to say, well, I can do what I want. I can live how I want and serve God. No, you can't. And if you try to serve God, you're serving the wrong God. Because God Almighty in His Word is clear that you have to get saved, then you change your life, you separate yourself, and then He'll call you to do something. And these people were servants. Now with all that in mind, look at verse number 29, because this is the main thought I really want you to take away this morning. It says, they clave to their brethren. Remember we came to that word clave? I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago. The word clave. Or to cleave. It means to be united. In Genesis chapter number 2, I believe it is. At the end of Genesis chapter number 2, God had created Adam and Eve. He brought them together. And the Bible says that a man is supposed to leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, which means that they become one. They become united. All right? The Bible says that these brethren, these people who are symbolic of you and I as Christians, they clave to one another. They became united. Remember what Jesus said, that a house divided cannot stand? A house that has internal problems cannot stand? This morning, folks, if we want to see God bless our church and to do a great work here, we have to be on the same page. That means we can't say, hey, preacher, I'm with you, and then as soon as we walk out the door... If you don't agree with me at all, show me why you don't agree with me from the Bible. And if I'm wrong, I'll change. But if you can't show me from the Bible, then either don't say anything or just leave the church. I got quiet there. Someone says, Preacher, aren't you worried about losing people? No, I'm worried about losing good, godly people. I'm not worried about losing someone who's going to complain and talk bad about the preacher or disagree with everything the preacher does. When I know I'm laying my heart out on the, the line there and I'm giving everything i got on the field, I want people that are going to support me, not people that are going to shoot me in the back. Hey, when you're going out to war, you don't turn around and ask these other guys, are we all on the same page? You're not going to stab me in the back when I go out there, right? They just charge together. So we have got to be united if we want to see God do something. We've got to be an army that is uh, God's army serving together, united for the same cause. Look at verse 29 and entered into a curse. By the way, hang on, let me stop for a second. I'm not saying that because somebody's saying anything to me or anybody's calling me or anybody's talking about me. I'm just making sure that everybody understands what the Bible teaches and, and what we need to stand on here, okay, as far as being united. All right, verse number 29. And entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law. That's the thought right there. These people were united. They came together. The walls have been rebuilt. These are saved separated, serving people, and they said, you know what? Let's make an oath. A promise. A vow. Last Sunday morning, and I forgot, man, I forgot again. Forgot to take the change offering, didn't I? We'll have to do it at the end of the service. Last Sunday morning, I jokingly, the kids came back up here, I look over, and I see a piece of paper in one of the offering plates. And I immediately think it's an IOU. Somebody put an IOU in the offering plate. I've done it before. And I, I don't it was the Holy Spirit that said, it must be this person. So I called him out. I said, did you put that in there? Now the other day I was joking with that person. And I said, hey, an IOU is a vow. It's a promise. Okay, now I'm just using that as an example. We need to make a vow, a promise. Not necessarily an IOU as far as I'll get it to you later, God. But we need to say, hey, we're united this morning as a church family. And we're going to make a promise before God and to God. And what is that promise going to be in verse number 29? To walk in God's law. To walk in truth. This morning, we as a church family need to come together and say, you know what? We're on the same page. We want to see people reach for the cause of Christ. We want to see God do something great here. And for that purpose, we're going to come together and we're going to make a promise that we are going to walk in God's law together. That means we're going to be accountable to each other. That means if I miss church, I want you to call me and ask why I miss church. And I may have a perfectly good reason, but I want you to at least call me because I need to be in church. 
what if I would have missed this morning? If I had didn't show up to church this morning, I guarantee you I would have gotten at least one phone call, hopefully a number of phone calls. Hey, uh, hopefully a number, unless they found a new preacher. Uh, hopefully a number of phone calls of people saying, Preacher, what happened? You didn't show up. Are you okay? If we'll call when the preacher's there, we should call when somebody else isn't there. Amen. Why is the preacher so important that if he misses, we call him, but we don't call others when they miss? Hey, we need to make this oath. Hey, we're going to check on you. We're going to pray for you. And by the way, you do the same for us because we're going to walk in God's law together. Amen. I don't know about you, but I hate doing things alone. One of the things uh, I, I've noticed over the last 13 years is I've been a part of uh, the Davis family, married into the Davis family. Brother Davis doesn't like to do things alone, do you, brother? He doesn't like to run to the grocery store alone. He likes taking someone with him. Hey, Abby, Naomi, Esther, who wants to go? Someone's got, got to go. I don't like doing things alone either. Really, uh, people that like to be alone, that concerns me. Uh, people who are introverted and they, they just want to be by themselves, it concerns me a little bit. Because God has put us here to fellowship with each other, to encourage each other, to challenge each other. He has put us here to help each other out. And here it says that they made this oath. But I want you to notice something else out of verse number 29 real quickly before we close. Look at the beginning of the verse. They claimed to their brother and their nobles and entered into a curse. It not only says that they made an oath, but they entered into a curse. In other words, we are going to walk in God's law. We are going to live according to His Word. And as we do, God, we want you to bless us as a whole. But we also understand that as we turn away or if we turn away from you, we're going to be cursed for it. We're going to bring a reproach on ourselves and on your name, and there's going to be a judgment for that. Folks, every person in our church needs to understand this morning that what you do doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody in your family. It affects everybody in your church family. If you say, hey, I'm going to do this because I like to do this, and I don't think that it's wrong, even though the Bible says it's wrong, you, you do that, and guess what? You affect the power of God on your church. You affect the power of God on your, on your family at home. Your sin, your rejection of God's Word and His law doesn't just affect you, but affects those around you. And we need to have that mindset this morning that we understand we're going to walk in truth. We're going to make an oath, a promise to God that we're going to do our best for the next six months. We're halfway through the year. Next six months, starting from now, we're going to try to Pray every day. Amen. We're going to try to read our Bible every day. Good. We're going to try to be in church every time the church doors are open, when we possibly can be. I understand sometimes people have to work. I understand physical ailments happen. But we're going to try to be in church whenever the church doors are open. We're going to try to tell other people about Jesus. We're going to carry tracts. We're going to go soul winning. We're going to do what we can. We're going to give to the ministries. We're going to try to support our missionaries. We're going to do everything that we can. And we need to make that promise to God today that we, as a church family, are going to walk in truth. You know, if you think about this story, once again, Nehemiah and them came back to rebuild the walls. And as I said to you before, sometimes the walls get broken down, don't they? Sometimes we just need to regroup, and we need to say, okay, whew, we made it for the, through the first six months. We had a few rough points. And to be honest with you, over the last month, we've had a few rough points as a church. We've had some bright spots, but we've had a few rough points. Uh, leading up to this college activity, I picked up my wife Thursday. From Thursday uh, after I picked her up until Saturday morning, just like the devil was fighting left and right. I'll be honest with you. Saturday when we were getting ready to have the activity, I almost didn't want to do it. I almost didn't want to be here. I almost thought to myself, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And then all of a sudden I saw young people from our church come through the doors. The other two churches were running late. They called me and told me. And they came late and they started walking through the doors. We had our singing time. We had our game. We had our challenge. We went in and ate, played games. And at the end of it, I knew that God had that activity yesterday. Not for you three ladies. He had that activity for me. Because I needed that. Amen. I was encouraged by Brother Asparelli, the assistant pastor from Antica. I was encouraged by Pastor Layman from Turlock. I was encouraged by those young people. They encouraged me. You know what, we, what I needed? I needed to regroup. 
I needed to regroup and say, hey, let's go forward again. Let's go ahead and walk in God's truth. Let's not give up. And sometimes we need to do that because the walls get broken down and we need to regroup and say, we're going forward for God. That's what I want to encourage all of you to do this morning. Make that vow to God. Make that promise over the next six months. Lord, half the year's gone, but I got six more months in 2014 that I can give to you. I'm going to do everything in my power to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you would take what was said this morning and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Father, I pray that if there's one here who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that they'd make that decision today. They would not put it off for another time. Lord God, I pray for those that are already born again, believers. Lord, I pray that you would challenge each and every one of us that we need to regroup and make that oath, make that promise that we are going to serve you. But Father, may we also understand that there's a consequence that comes with making that oath. If we at any point in time decide to turn back or we rebel, Father, there's going to be a judgment for it. Father, I just pray that you'd help us to understand the seriousness of this. Father, I pray that you'd help us to move forward for the cause of Christ the rest of this year. In Jesus' name we pray.